The anatomy that's relevant for, net, for phonetics includes three systems used in speech production. The respiratory system at the bottom of the image provides an egressive or an outgoing airflow that gives us the energy for speech. The laryngeal system uses the vocal folds to interrupt the airstream to create vibration for voiced sounds in speech. And the soup laryngeal system, the system above the larynx, um, is the articulatory system where the jaw, the tongue, the lips, the velum affect the shape of the resonating pharyngeal, oral, and nasal cavities, creating the distinctions between different speech sounds. In the respiratory system, we have two primary processes. One is inspiration, bringing air into the lungs by expanding the thoracic cavity. We do that through muscular contraction using uh, primary muscles like the diaphragm and the external intercostals to expand, to expand the lungs through their pleural connection to the diaphragm and the ribs, the pleural membranes that cause the lungs to move along with the diaphragms and ribs. Increasing lung volume reduces air pressure and causes air to flow into the lungs. During expiration, the thoracic cavity is contracted. This consists primarily of passive forces, the fact that the tissues uh, have been stretched out, the ribs have been moved, and those things all wanting to return back to their uh, neutral resting state. We can create additional contraction using internal intercostal muscles. When we decrease the lung volume, we increase the air pressure on the air inside the lungs, and so that air will flow out to try to uh, balance that pressure back out with atmospheric pressure. During speech production, contraction of the thoracic cavity is carefully controlled so that we have the right amount of air th flow through the larynx in order to make phonation happen for vowels, for example. And we also may create extra bursts of air uh, through muscular contraction to get something like a stop burst. Speech production happens during expiratory speech breathing, generally in units up to about 10 seconds in time, and so the way we produce our speech is coordinated to fit within these uh, uh, groups defined by a breath. Uh, so, we string together several words, phrases, or sentences within a single breath. A pause that happens for inspiration to refill the lungs is time to occur between linguistic units, uh, usually something that you could define syntactically as a phrase. Within the laryngeal system, uh, we use the vocal folds in the larynx uh, to create phonation for voiced sounds. To do that, the vocal folds are adducted or brought together, closing the space between the vocal folds, which is known as the glottis. Vibration of the vocal folds, then, uh, is uh, used to create noise. Um, in anatomy and physiology, we have the myoelastic aerodynamic theory, so vocal fold vibration is created by a balance between tension of the vocal folds through muscular contraction against the amount of subglottal air pressure you get, air beneath the glottis, um, generated by expiratory airflow. So we need the right balance of air pressure from below and muscular tension holding the vocal folds close to each other but not clamping them shut uh, tightly in order to get phonation to happen. This is the primary source of sound for uh, voiced sounds, and this is where the pitch of the voice comes from that's part of our intonation. The process of phonation can be described through the glottal cycle, which we have depicted in the image on the right. Um, air flows through the glottis um, as the vocal folds are opened and closed, but that opening and closing isn't active. The vocal folds are held close to each other, are held in a closed position, and the opening is created by air pressure. So in the uh, image, starting with images 1 and 2, we have an increasing number of little black dots meant to represent air molecules. Um, 
that will uh, uh, create an increased air pressure beneath the vocal folds. Once the air pressure has built sufficiently, as in images 3 and 4, it will push the vocal folds apart. And then the release of that air pressure allows the vocal folds to come back together again. Uh, once some air flows out, the air pressure drops and the muscular uh, tension becomes enough to close off the glottis again. This cycle will continue until the vocal folds are abducted, until they're actively moved apart, um, moving the vocal folds away from each other and opening up the glottis to stop that voicing uh, or to take a breath uh, for respiration. In this process of phonation, the vocal folds vibrate in cycles. We can analyze that rate of vibration um, in terms of how many cycles that happen per second or a unit of hertz. We'll be talked about a fair bit more in speech science. This is known as the fundamental frequency of speech. This is an important part of the rhythm of speech, which overall is called intonation. Intonation includes uh, not just the fundamental frequency, but also uh, the duration of different words and the timing of words relative to one another. So there's an example graph here of uh, the measure of fundamental frequency over time when producing a phrase. Um, part points of um, focus or syntactic importance will have higher fundamental frequencies. So if you look at the graph and think about the phrases, uh, is there emphasis just on hello? Is there F emphasis on how and you? Or is there emphasis just on R? Looking at the low point in the graph uh, above R, answer C seems like a poor choice. Um, so we're between emphasis just on the first word or um, emphasis on the second and fourth. Uh, and my best guess is uh, the best answer is B, something like, hello, how are you? The supralaryngeal system has the uh, most different anatomical units in it that are relevant to us in the study of speech sounds in phonetics. We usually look at the supralaryngeal system with a side view of the vocal tract uh, down the midline uh, where the major articulations take place. The vocal tract can be divided up into three different cavities, the oral cavity above the tongue, uh, the nasal cavity, um, behind your nose, uh, and the pharynx at the back of the throat. Um, all three of these cavities are potential resonating spaces for the um, phonation sound that comes from the larynx. There are a variety of important articulatory landmarks that are part of the supralaryngeal system. In this image, we can see the upper lip and the upper teeth, which are not marked uh, specifically, the alveolar ridge, the hard palate, and the velum, which are all marked specifically. Uh, the uvula is marked, but it's not really distinctively used for uh, speech sounds in English. There are some other languages that do have um, consonant sounds where uh, the tongue is retracted toward the uvula to create that sound. Uh, and then not marked in this image, we also have the posterior pharyngeal wall, which helps define um, the outside of the articulatory space in the pharyngeal cavity. And so as we look at how the shaping um, of articulations within the pharyngeal cavity and oral cavity um, create the resonating space for speech, um, uh, those upper surfaces in the oral cavity and the posterior pharyngeal wall are going to be relevant. We also have a variety of mobile articulators in the supralaryngeal system. Uh, we have uh, the lips, the jaw, the tongue, and the velum, all which can be moved to make articulations happen. Um, this image has the posterior pharyngeal wall in it, and for some speakers that is um, actively pulled forward in the creation of some speech sound. This image also has the epiglottis marked, um, 
It's not an active articulator in English, but there are languages that um, pull the epiglottis back toward the posterior pharyngeal wall to create consonants. Uh, and the vocal folds will also be viewed as an active articulator for a couple of our speech sounds that have a laryngeal articulation only. Here we have two MRI images of the vocal tract. So these are uh, images uh, in the mid-sagittal plane of uh, actual humans, not just drawings. Um, where you can see these variety of articulatory landmarks, get some idea of their uh, shape and orientation uh, relative to one another. In an adult on the left, where the uh, neck is much longer, uh, which makes the pharyngeal area uh, quite a bit longer as well, um, versus a child on the right, uh, where the neck is uh, somewhat shorter, uh, the pharyngeal cavity, relatively speaking, is shorter. There are fewer differences in terms of the tongue and the oral cavity. Um, the main difference there is near the pharyngeal cavity in uh, the location of the velum, which uh, isn't really separated from the tongue in this uh, particular image, and that's actually uh, common for young children. It is an aid in their early um, eating behavior, for example.